Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the two books, the two little books in the Old Testament entitled Ezra and Nehemiah, two of the famous people of the Old Testament. This is lesson number five in that series for November 2 of 2019 entitled Violating the Spirit of the Law. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Well, let's begin as we always do with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we've come once again to look at these passages in Scripture and try to understand the context in which they took place and to find ways in which perhaps we can learn something. Undoubtedly, we can learn something from Nehemiah and Ezra long ago, how to better live our lives today. May that be the experience not only of those of us who are here, but of those who listen in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we can give you a shorthand to most of the passages in this book, in this, yeah, in this lesson. It's almost all about Nehemiah 5. Have you ever been tempted to do something that was legal, but not, strictly speaking, honest or not ethical? I, whenever I think about people always telling the truth, I think about, we do this all the time. Suppose you're not feeling very good, but you feel like you have to go to work. And you come in the door and someone says, how are you today? I'm fine. <laughs> Is that a lie? It's positive thinking, maybe. <laughs> it's positive. Yeah, nobody wants to hear your troubles when you walk right. in the door. Nobody wants to hear <laughs> your troubles. Especially if you're sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. what are you doing here? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what are you doing here? And there are other times when we, we, we do things because we don't want to stop and take the time to explain why this or that. I mean, how far, where's the border between... You know, you're just being socially gracious and and actually lying. Mm. Well, almost from the beginning of time, humans have struggled with the question of wealth, poverty, and the gap between the rich and the poor. Jesus stated, you have the poor with you always, Matthew 26, 11, NKJV. Does that give those who have more money or power the right to abuse them? No. That surely wouldn't be the Christian thing to do. Well, in Nehemiah 5, the main subject of our lesson for this week, follows a very clear structure. And let's look at that. Number one, people's troubles and complaints and Nehemiah's decisive action. That's the overall theme. First of all, the people have reason for their grievances. Nehemiah 5, 1 through 5. Nehemiah, respond, when he learns about it, he responds with anger and a rebuke. Nehemiah 5, 6 and 7. Nehemiah's call for a public assembly calls for a public assembly and is charged against the leaders. Nehemiah five seven b and to eight a. By the way, um, these verses. Who decided on these verses? Someone. They, the scholars jokingly say he was riding on the back of a horse, bumping along <laughs> on his way from 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 uh, Madrid to Paris. Anyway. It wasn't decided until 551, and the only reason the verses were assigned to the Bible is to make it easier, with the concordance, easier to find things. Find, yeah. That was the first time, fi 1551 was the first time there were verses, so you can see where some of these verses probably didn't happen at exactly the right spot. Anyway, so you then... Not inspired? Not inspired. Chapters were not inspired, verse divisions were not inspired... And what did the leaders say when they were approached with this challenge? Silent. They were silent. Nehemiah 5, 8b. Then Nehemiah's admonition of leaders, uh, admonishment of leaders to walk in the fear of God and to return properties to people and repair the losses. Nehemiah 5, 9 through 11. Then the leaders did what? Said, yes, we will do it. Nehemiah 5, 12a. And again, the oath of leaders, Nehemiah's symbolic action and people's grateful praise to the Lord. And then finally going on, Nehemiah's 12 years of diligent and non-selfish ministry in chapter 5, 14 to 16, his daily generous supply for the numerous people and visitors, verses 17 and 18, 
and finally his prayer for mercy. So now you already have an idea of what we're going to be studying. So this story occurred in the middle of a great national effort to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And of course, the events that happened after that is they tried to recover more and more of the territory. <coughs> it would seem that everyone was working together and things were going well, but that was not the whole picture. Uh, Dennis, I think you can start us off there. Nehemiah 5, 1 to 5. Sometime later, many of the people, both men and women, began to complain against their fellow Jews. Some said, we have large families and we need corn to keep us alive. Others said, we have had to mortgage our fields and vineyards and houses to get enough corn to keep us from starving. Can I interrupt for a second? This is a British version of an American Bible, and so corn means what? Wheat. Means wheat. We're really talking about, it's not the corn we call corn, it's yes. what the British call corn, which is wheat. Okay, go ahead. Still others said, we had to borrow money to pay the royal tax on our fields and vineyards. We are of the same race as our fellow Jews. Aren't our children just as good as theirs? But we have but we have to make slaves of our children. Some of our daughters have already been sold as slaves. We are helpless because our fields and vineyards have been taken away from us. Good wow. news Bible. Mm. So, why do you suppose this issue came up at this point in time? I mean, this wasn't the beginning of the problem. But it was getting worse. It was getting worse, and what else? There was someone who could do something about it and is whom it, they could trust. Yeah. Is it possible that those who are being misused, even abused by others, more powerful, more the more powerful or rich, had been afraid to speak out until they saw that Nehemiah was the kind of leader who would speak, out for the, speak up for the truth? Very likely. So I'm saying, where was Ezra? Yeah. Well, Ezra was probably there, but he wasn't the... Ezra was busy with his scriptures and trying to teach that. He wasn't the guy who was, was he in, back and forth and back to Susa. No, no, he was he, he was there. there. The time he was there the whole time. Nehemiah but, went back though, didn't he? Yeah, he he went back at one time. Yeah, yeah went back went for a time. But Ezra Ezra felt like he could give them the word of God and expected them to do. He 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 was never the governor, so he didn't have any official royal authority to do things. Nehemiah did. So you know, and I think they probably had different personalities. Yeah, he, well, Nehemiah had a lot of presence, but yeah. otherwise he wouldn't have been able to do that yeah. in he the time it took to motivate everyone. Yeah, he slept with his sword. <laughs> that's a, that's, a, that's another, part of the, the, another part of the story here. About the bullwhip. <laughs> well, we do not know all the details of what was going on in the world at that point in time. Here is a hint. <coughs> Jackie? Uh, it appears that the main culprit of the trouble was a famine in tax payments that caused the poorer families to seek help from their neighbors. The Persian government required a tax of 350 talents of silver annually from the province of Judah. Now, let me interrupt for a second. Mm -hmm. How much is a talent? Oh. Oh. A lot. Um, well, it's there, it, between 50 and 60 pounds. That's a lot of silver. Mm. That's a lot of silver. A, 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 an ounce, even less than an ounce, was considered a man's wage for the day. Mm. Okay, but of course this is the, the tax for, for the whole nation. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. If a person couldn't pay the designated portion of the mandatory tax, the family would usually mortgage their property or borrow money first. If, however, they couldn't earn the money the next year, then they had to do something about the debt they now owed. Usually debt slavery was the next option. They had already lost their land, and now they had to send someone from the family, usually children, to be in the service of the creditor in order to work off the debt. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Mm. I want everyone here, I think, is probably a parent. I want you to try to imagine sending one of your kids off to slavery to pay the family debts. Mm, that's, can't imagine. And this may not have been just to do work. No. Yes. Yeah, we're going to learn more about that in a moment. 
While it is true that often people get themselves into financial difficulties or other problems because of their own behavior, there are also times when things or events such as famine and taxes occur that are completely out of their control that can create serious problems. In our day, the very idea of slavery seems repulsive. But in ancient times, debt slavery was a fairly common occurrence and provided a way for someone to deal with a debt that they could not otherwise pay. Now, let's remember, we're going to talk about this more in a moment. What system did the Jews have for dealing with debts? Every seven years. Every seven years, what was supposed to happen? All debts were supposed to be forgiven. <coughs> okay. So, Margaret? All right, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 5, 6 to 8. When I heard their complaints, I was angry and decided to act. I denounced the leaders and officials of the people and told them, You are oppressing your fellow Jews. I called a public assembly to deal with the problem and said, As far as we have been able, we have been buying back our Jewish relatives who had to sell themselves to foreigners. Now you are forcing your own relatives to sell themselves to you, their own people. The leaders were silent and could have, they could find nothing to say. Wow. So, I mean, imagine, you know, here you are living with these other people right around you, and in some cases you've had, some of the Jews have had to sell some of their family members to one of these other people <coughs> to, to help pay their debts. And now Nehemiah finds out about this. He says, okay, let's just work together. Let's buy back the Jews that have been sold to these other people. And then what does he find out? They were doing it to each other. They were doing it to each other. Well, Taking advantage of the poor. That's yeah. one of the sins that's yes. admonished many times in the Bible. So God had given clear advice about this, clear guidance before, right, Jim? Exodus 21, 2-7. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you for six years. In the seventh year, he is to be set free without having to pay anything. If he was unmarried when he became your slave, he is not to take a wife with him when he leaves. That's after the six years. But if he was married when he became your slave, he may take his wife with you, with him. If his master gave him a wife and she bore him sons or daughters... The woman and her children belong to the master, and the man shall leave by himself. But if the slave declares that he loves his master, his wife, and his children, and does not want to be set free, then his master shall take him to the place of worship. There he is to make him stand against the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear. Then he will be his slave for life. So now you can look around and anybody who has pierced ears, you know that they're slaves for life. <laughs> right? <laughs> Verse 7 says, if a man sells his daughter as a slave, she is not to be set free as male slaves are. Okay, ladies. A lot of questions there. Yeah, what do you say about that? that? Yeah. 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 A lot okay, of Okay, let's think about this. Why would it be like that? Well, probably... Women were not equal. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's, that's true. It. We've but obviously they were seen. also probably used for sex, and well, they had no chance to get married. Okay. Well, so what? Like, what probably happened most of the time is they would buy these women to be wives to someone they already have as a slave, so there would be more children that would also be his slaves. So that. These women almost certainly would be would be bought for producing more children, and so if she goes back, then she's taken some of the property quote property with her. It's also so we way. were worth more. Of course, <laughs> it's also a way to keep the men from going, from leaving. Yeah. Well, it's a sad story, and you no other way yes. to look at it. But it was a better system than any other country around them. Yeah. We're going to read more about that in a moment. In the ancient world, the custom of selling oneself or a family member, even a child, into slavery for a period of time to pay for debts was unfortunately fairly common. Think of our day. What if we, had, we didn't have banks or, 
or a financial institution to loan to loan us money to buy houses, to do buy cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we had to pay cash for everything we purchase, it'd be a lot less purchasing. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Wow. In his instructions in Exodus, God was putting a limitation on how lengthy that slavery could be. Another part of the problem that was affecting the Jewish people in Nehemiah's day was the problem of lending for interest. Gordon? This is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday. Although lending was permitted by the law, charging interest was not. And there's some references. And yet the interest that the lenders charged was small compared to what the nations around them charged. They were asked to pay 1% per month. That is, the Israel was. Mm -hmm. Mesopotamian texts suggest that the 7th century show interest of 50% for silver and 100% for grain annually. Wow. Thus, the 12% interest per year was low compared to the practice of the countries in Mesopotamia. But overall, according to God's word, the only thing the creditors did wrong was to charge interest. And surprisingly, the people didn't even mention that in their grievance. Everything else was within the social norm as well as within the provisions of the law. So why is Nehemiah very angry? Remarkably, he doesn't act right away, but gives the matter some serious thought. Wow. He contemplates... Okay, so what do you think about that whole arrangement? What do you, about God's plan? Was that a better plan? Clearly, it's fair to families for, for, for slaves to be released. But then, what about the? I mean, why would you? You know, some people, if you're very concerned about your money, why would you loan it if you're not going to get any interest? He's supposed to do it because it's the right thing to do. Take a look at Ezekiel 18. Yeah. If you lend a distress, you're going to die. That's yeah. Ezekiel 18. Wow. So well, the, we, we have usury laws today, and mm -hmm. you know, supposedly preventing these exorbitant interest rates, but the 12 percent, that's allowed. Yeah. The 100 percent, I think they call wow. those uh, loan sharks and. Yeah. And the mob and so on. Yeah, really. Wow. Well, these commands make it very clear that while it is quite acceptable to lend money to a fellow Jew who was in need or in trouble, they were not allowed to charge interest for what they had lent. Unfortunately, such oppressive measures often happen during times of economic hardship. That makes a bad situation worse. Myra? Micah 6, 6 to 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring him the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this. To do what is just and to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Okay. Now, if you're following the law, isn't that doing what's just? If it's the law legal? Is just. What? If the law is yeah. just. If the law is just. Yeah, depends. Okay. Well, I think of Ellen White saying that the law uh, in regard to slaves, runaway slaves, that this was not just and we shouldn't obey it, or they okay. wouldn't obey wow. it back then. Wow, you mean, you mean a prophet of God could tell you to disobey the law? That one, yeah. How many wow. times did Jesus disobey the law? He showed constant <laughs> love. <laughs> if, if you go just by the basis of, of the information we have in the Bible, he probably disobeyed it more often than he obeyed it. <laughs> well, especially the Sabbath laws. Certain laws, laws sure. Especially, yeah, especially the Sabbath rules and so forth. That wasn't, he, that wasn't the only thing he disobeyed, although m many of them were related to, to the Sabbath, it's true. Uh, healing people and... and uh, anyway. So clearly God says, there are... In other words, you are supposed to have a moral compass in your brain. 
you are supposed to have some idea about what's right and what's wrong. And if the law says do this, but you recognize that really that's not right, what are you supposed to do? Obey God rather than man. Yeah. yeah, do what's right. So these verses make it very clear that the followers, that true followers of God are to do the right thing even if it's not required by the law. Jim? Then I said, well, this is uh, Jeremiah. Oh, Nehemiah. What, Nehemiah 5, 9 to 12. Then I said, what you are doing is wrong. You ought to obey God and to do what is right. Then you would not give our enemies, the Gentiles, any reason to ridicule us. I have yet, excuse me, I have let the people borrow money and corn from me, and so have my companions and the people who work around me, excuse me, work for me. Now there's, excuse me, now let's give up all our claims to repayment. Cancel all the debts they owe you, money or corn or wine or olive oil, and give them back their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses at once. The leaders replied, We'll do as you say. We'll give the property back and try not to col- and not-, not try to collect the debts. I called in the priests and made the leaders swear in front of them to keep the promises they had just made. Good wow. News. Is so, that kind of like forgiving uh, tuition? <clears throat> yeah. Well, nothing changes uh, <laughs> the politics. So look at the sequence here. So he's working long, trying to get the wall built, trying to do all these kinds of things, and then he hears these things, and people come to him, and they say, maybe you can help us. This is what's happened. He's angry. What does he do? Thinks about it. Thinks about it a little bit, then he says, we've got to do something. So what does he do then? Seems like he overreacted. Think so? I mean. Why do you think he did that? Well, he was in a certain mood, I think. Okay. After hearing about it, he was He wanted to make sure he wanted to make sure that what these people had promised they would literally do. And he's not done yet. He's not, he gets a priest, he calls the priest out and says, make an oath in front of the priest here. Right? Yeah. So after reproaching the elders and the rich people among them, Nehemiah could have felt that he had done his duty. But he did not. He wanted to make sure that the problem was rectified. He says, I'm, I'm not stopping here. So he called a general assembly. We do not know how many people actually came, but Nehemiah was counting on the presence of a large group of people to add weight to his demands that the, prophet be, that the problem be fixed. Clearly, in this case, it worked. The leaders replied, we will do as you say. So now, imagine you calling together a big group of people, and these are people who know each other. I mean, there's a, it's not a, you know, thousands and thousands. Most of them have some idea, at least, about knowing each other. And... Nehemiah says, so and so and so and so and so and so have done this that they aren't supposed to do and they've been taking money and they're going to return it. You think that's a good idea? Well, what do you say in front of the huge crowd, most of whom have been let borrowers? Well, we know God was working in that area and I think that they already felt guilty. Otherwise, mm-hmm. oh, they yeah. wouldn't have acquiesced so quickly. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's actually a very good point. Yeah, of how they reacted to mm-hmm. the leaders, and notice the people who've been loaning money to people and extracting stuff and all that kind of stuff replied, "We will do as you say." So, how did those kind of people get to be the leaders? You ever thought about that? They filled the void. Or they had the the wealth, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so the wealthy people yeah. were looked up to, yeah. and, yeah. and well, maybe no one else would do it. Yeah, it's possible. As we read through Nehemiah 5, it becomes apparent that some Jews had even been sold as slaves to foreigners. Fortunately, Nehemiah, along with others, had gone to some effort to buy back all the Jews who were enslaved by foreigners. So apparently, he was 
around saying, you know, you, you got money, you got money, can you help me? Let's buy these people back again. Well, I mean, how how do you feel about that kind of response in dealing with somebody who's the leader is doing this kind of stuff? You can't, how, how would you dare to argue with him? I mean, he's doing everything right, you know. Well, that was a lot of effort, a lot of expense, and obviously it was according to God's plan. Then Nehemiah said, how can you buy Jews back from foreigners only to enslave them or others like them yourselves? Yeah. And how can you argue with that logic? Fortunately, Nehemiah himself had been setting an excellent example by lending people money and grain and not charging interest. Now, he had also helped to buy back Jews who were enslaved by foreigners. In light of all this, it would have been very difficult for those leaders abusing their, he- their fellow Hebrews not to comply with Nehemiah's demands. Now, if, if Nehemiah had not been doing the right thing himself, it would be easier for them to say, but look at you, you know, da, da, da. But here's a man who's down the line. He's doing everything right. Well, fortunately, you, Nehemiah had a lot of money to do some of these good deeds. And where did he get all that money? From the, From king. the king. From the king. From the Maybe. Emperor. Maybe. I hope so. Well, do situations like this discussed in Nehemiah 5 ever happen today? Do we ever do wrong to someone else, even accidentally? Do we always do our best to make it right? Well, Nehemiah is not done yet. Nehemiah 5, 12 and 13. The leaders replied, We'll do as you say. We'll give the property back and not try to collect the debts. Hold on for a second now. You suppose that means returning slaves? Probably, yeah. Probably does mean include returning slaves. And imagine, I mean, you, get, you, go for, you go to a big assembly. And Nehemiah gets up and he makes this kind of speech. And you have been in debt over your over, over your head. You just don't have any way that you're going to figure out how to get out of this. And you go home feeling like you can walk on a cloud, right? Oh yeah. Just imagine, and probably a lot of people like that. Go ahead. I I called. Uh, wait a minute. I called in the priests and made the leaders swear in front of them to keep the promise they had just made. Then I took off the sash I was wearing round my waist and shook it out. This is how God will shake any of you who don't keep your promise, I said. God will take away your houses and everything you own and will leave with you with nothing. Everyone who is present said amen and praise the Lord, and the leaders kept their promise. Oh, wow. So he shakes his lesson, <laughs> he shakes his sash out and says, "You're going to end up with nothing." And everyone says, "Amen." I mean, what kind of response was that? I mean, he's doing a good thing, but I mean, they 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 felt pretty strongly about it. It seems like, right? And yeah, that was an object lesson. Yes. Well, he called together the priests and made the leaders swear in front of them. Hmm. Are we supposed to be doing that kind of stuff? Obviously, Nehemiah was taking every step possible to make sure that those who had done wrong corrected the error. But what, what's with this curse? It literally says in, in, in the King James, he pronounced a curse. What does that mean? Once again, there were very clear Old Testament instructions about how vows were supposed to be used. Let's, we have a moment. Let's look at a couple of verses. Numbers 30, verse 2. When a man makes a vow to give something to the Lord or takes an oath to abstain from something, he <coughs> must not break his promise but must do everything that he said he would. Pick another one. Deuteronomy 23, 21 and 23. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not put off doing what you promised. The Lord will hold you to your vow and it is, and it is a sin not to keep it. It is no sin not to make a vow to the Lord, but if you make one voluntarily, be sure that you keep it. Do we have um, any problem with that when it comes times to 
pay our tithes and our offerings in the church and so forth. Or when we promise, make promises for the building fund or mm -hmm. other things. Let me pick one more. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5. So when you make a promise to God, keep it as quickly as possible. He has no use for a fool. Do what you promise to do. Better not to promise at all than to make a promise not keep it. Would we all agree with that? Probably. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, Jesus told us not to use very many oaths. He said that yes should mean yes, and no should mean no. That would be wonderful if everyone did it. But how often do our words disagree with our behavior? How many people have been turned off from Christianity by behaviors which they do not think are Christian? Wow. I'm mm. reminded of the story of Gandhi, and I'm sure you can tell it better than I can. So go ahead. Well, Gandhi was asked about Christianity, and he said, basically, uh, Christianity is a wonderful religion. It's just we don't see very many people who are acting like Jesus Christ, basically. He said, if, and he, and he, ba he even went on to say that uh, if everybody was, who claimed to be a Christian was acting like Jesus Christ, he would, be, he would become a Christian himself. Hmm. Amazing. Well, humans are distinct in the animal world because of our ability to speak. Speech is a very powerful gift that God has given us. Every word we utter should be uttered with care and concern for others and the impact those words might have. Are we always careful in what we say and the way we say it and when we say it? Dennis, I think that's for you. Nehemiah 5, 14 to 19. During all the 12 years that I was governor of the land of Judah, from the tw 20th year that Artaxerxes was emperor until his 23rd year, neither 30, my... 32nd. 32nd, I'm sorry. Neither my relatives nor I ate the food I was entitled to have as governor. Every governor who, has, who had been in office before me had been a burden to the people and had demanded 40 silver coins a day for food and wine. Even their servants had oppressed the people, but I acted differently because I honored God. I put all my energy into rebuilding the wall and did not acquire any property. And I interrupt for just a second. Who were those previous leaders? Well... Ezra was one of the people that led them, but he wasn't the he was governor. Not a governor. Zerubbabel was a governor. Okay, the only other one we know about was Zerubbabel. He had been, that was back. 50 years earlier. Yeah. So we do not know, and it's very likely that some of those governors in between there were not Jews. They were probably appointed by the, by the Persian government to rule over the Jewish people. These, some of these people from the quote, West Euphrates province and most likely, they were not they were not Jews or not Hebrews, so they didn't have any compassion, any any compassion. They just said, charge what they could charge and get away with it. Or could he have been referring to the fact that there are governors in regions all around in the Persian Empire, and this is what they do? Also, very likely, yeah. So go ahead. Everyone who worked for me joined in the rebuilding. I regularly fed at my table 150 of the Jewish people and their leaders, besides all the people who came to me from the surrounding nations. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. Basically, Nehemiah is acting like a president or a king or whatever. He was the representative. So if any, rep, any groups came to negotiate or talk about business or whatever, who was responsible for them? Was. Nehemiah was. I mean, imagine feeding 150 people on a regular, even one meal a day. Yeah. Well, he must have been financed by the king. Yeah. I On a regular basis, if he was doing it, that it much. It seems like it. I mean, a large better, store of better. funds. Yeah. Wow. Is he wealthy to start with? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. We don't know. And look what he served every yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but he'd been buy, he bought back servants... Plus supporting himself and loaning and, money, uh, yeah, and loaning money and uh, buying lumber, and buying, lumber. And buying me paying for meals for all these people. Mm -hmm. 
So he had to be very wealthy. That's a lot of money for some from somewhere. Kind of like Abraham and mm -hmm. Job. Yeah, read what he says there in yeah. verse 18. I mean, that's hey, go a, ahead. an amazing amount of... Yeah. yeah. Every day I served one ox, six of the best sheep, and many chickens. And every ten days I provided a fresh supply of wine. But I knew that knew what heavy burdens the people had to bear, so I did not claim the allowance that the governor is entitled to. I pray you, O oh Lord, remember to my credit everything that I have done for this people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, how did he do this? That's, yeah. <laughs> Every that, day. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of food, a lot of money. I mean, not only that, how many people does it take to prepare those? All that well, food. Have, well, that's, and, and yeah. They've got to be working for you, too. Yeah. If he was governor for 12 years, that's a lot of Mm-hmm. What about this last sentence, uh, verse yeah. 19? God, remember to my credit everything that I have done for this people. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to get credit for this. Yes. Is that what it, what he's actually saying? Well, you can read it just as well as I can. Well, the good well that's certainly what it looks like. Well, I think he rec he's, he's trying to... And Nehemiah makes statements like that several places through his book. And I, I think that he he was used to living in a place where everybody wanted credit for whatever they did. And I, I think this was normal for people in his day. So, I mean, I, I don't know. That's the, way, that's the way I have to read that. It wasn't that. that he doubted God. He was just saying, uh, I did what you sent me to do. Mm -hmm. So, Nehemiah served as governor of Judea for 12 years. You think Artaxerxes forgot about him in those 12 years? Not if he kept sending him money. <laughs> well, and you wonder if some of those freed yeah. slaves that he f paid for didn't say, I will come and work for you until I can do that. That's also possible. Considering what it says in verse 14, it is likely that these verses were penned after he'd returned to his job as wine taster for the emperor or even after he returned later for a second term as governor. And I just wonder, you know, if he showed up, uh, he's been gone for 12 years, is the governor immediately going to... I mean, obviously the governor must have had... I mean, the emperor must have had another wine taster while he was gone. He wouldn't have survived all the... I mean, he wouldn't have risked his life all those 12 years without someone to, to taste wines for him. We're not it, told anything about Nehemiah's family. No. Are we anywhere? No. Wife, children? Well, we know that he had cousins. Cousins. And brothers. But his own immediate family, we don't. No. No. No one. No. Well, we know later he returned for a second term of gov as governor. Who else do we read about in the Bible who showed up about that same time? Do you know? Some trivia questions again here. Malachi. Oh. So that that story that we read in Malachi is happening pretty soon now, when after Nehemiah comes back the second time. So Nehemiah came the first time, remember, in in 444 BC. He's he's um, governor for 12 years. That would be, take us down to 432 BC. Malachi is believed to been to have prophesied about 425 so we've got seven years in there and Nehemiah's back again do we know where Malachi came from or was he, he, he was part of the group he was, was part of the group he was part of the people who had been in Jerusalem yeah. for a while yeah so considering the funds Nehemiah had needed to provide to regularly feed at his table 100 and what about housing them not just feeding them housing them at his table, 150 of the Jewish people and their leaders, and noting what they must have cost him, it is suggested that he must have been very wealthy. Or, as you have suggested, maybe a, had a pipeline the emperor. Did he? But, of course, remember, he had those notes that said, give him whatever he needs. That's right. So that might have been his clue. They might not have even had to contact the emperor. He just said, you know, mm -hmm. pay me what I need. But that would have come from taxes. Yeah, it would have come from taxes. He himself did not demand the normal taxes that a governor was allowed to collect.
Perhaps he had other people working for him who helped him support this heavy uh, expense. Well, he obviously must have had a lot of people working for him just to prepare food and get all the stuff ready and so forth. Um, and how, whether they could have helped him to, to, to bring in some money, we don't know. Well, Nehemiah was not the first one to go beyond the legal requirements and return to the poor and needy that what was ethically right. Consider the story of Abraham after what happened to Abraham? What happened? Remember Abraham's story? Genesis 14. Let's look. We have a few moments. Let's look back there. Genesis 14. Four kings. Amraphel of Babylonia, Arioch of Eleazar, Keleleomer of Elam, and Tidal of Goim went to war against the five other kings, Bera of Sodom, Bersha of Gomorrah, Shinab of Adma, Shemab, Shemerber, uh, of Zeboim and the king of Bela or Zoar. These <coughs> five kings had formed an alliance and joined forces in the valley of Siddim, which is now the Dead Sea. They had been under the control of Kidiolamur for 12 years, but in the 13th year they rebelled against him. In the 14th year, Kedileomer and his allies came with their armies and defeated the Rephaim and Ashtoreth Karnaim, the Zuzim and Ham, the Emim in the plain of Kiriathayim, and the Horites in the mountains of Edom pursuing them as far as Elpanan on the edge of the desert. Then they turned around and came back to Kedesh, then known as en -Mishpat. They conquered all the land of the Amalekites and defeated the Amorites who lived in Hezazan Tamar. So these people are just rampaging through the territory, right? Then the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela drew up their armies for battle in the valley of Siddim and fought against the kings Elam, Goim, Babylonian and Elisar, five kings against four. The valley was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to run away from the battle, they fell into the pits, but the three other kings escaped to the mountains. The four kings took everything in Sodom and Gomorrah, including the food, and went away. Lot, Abraham's nephew, was living in Sodom, so they took him and all his possessions. Now, how, how come Lot is living in the valley down there? Sure. His choice. Well, his, yeah, his choice. Chose, he, he chose to leave Abraham. <coughs> the story was there's not enough grasslands for Abraham's herds and Lot's herds. So let's separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Lot chose the valley, Sodom. Someone, a man, escaped and reported all this to Abraham, the Hebrew, who was living near the sacred trees belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. So that was up on the, on the edge of the escarpment and near the town of uh, what would be Hebron today. Mamre and his brothers Eshcol and Aner were Abraham's allies. When Abraham heard this, that his nephew had been captured, he called together all the fighting men in his camp, 318 in all, and pursued the four kings all the way to Dan. He had a few slaves. A what was he doing with 318 <laughs> fighting men? Protecting his herds. Protecting his herds. That's almost certainly what they were doing. So just, um, and Ellen White says he had about a thousand people in his household. A thousand people in his household. And here's 318 of them that are basically soldiers. Warriors. Warriors. And what did they do? He divided his men into groups, attacked the enemy at night, and defeated them. They had no idea that Enu was coming after them. He caught them completely by surprise. He chased them as far as Hoba, north of Damascus. And that, I mean, that's, that's quite a few miles. And recovered the loot that had been taken. He also brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other prisoners. When Abraham came back, and here's our point, from his victory over Ketaleomer and the other kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, also called the King's Valley. And Melchizedek, who was king of Salem, that would be Jerusalem, and also a priest of the Most High God brought bread and wine to Abraham, blessed him and said, May the Lord Most High God, the Most High God who made heaven and earth, bless Abram. May the Most High God who gave you victory over your enemies be praised. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all that he loot he had recovered. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Keep the loot, but give me back all my people. Abraham answered, I solemnly swear before the Lord, the Most High God, maker of heaven and earth, that I will not keep anything of yours, not even a thread or a sandal strap. Then you can never say, I am the one who made Abram rich. 
I will take nothing for myself. I will accept only what my men have used, but my allies, da 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 da, take their share. Okay? So what's happening here? What is Abraham doing? He's being generous. See, I, I, don't, he's, I don't he's need doing what is I don't need your goods. I don't need your no. money. Yeah. I have a thousand people working for me already. So he tried to give it back to the people that had owned it to start with. Yeah, he tried to give it to back. Boy, talk about fairness. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's like Nehemiah's story. It's probably not fairness, it's generosity. Yeah. It's, yeah. More than fairness. Yeah. Abraham insisted that as far as possible, all the recaptured goods should be returned to their original owners. Clearly, Nehemiah, like Abraham, before him put the Lord and the Lord's work before his own personal gain or advantage. How often do we do that? Do we have someone else who gives us an example? Look at Philippians 2, verses 3 to 8. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look, at, and look out for a one another's interest not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Wow. So, if we're going to be Christians and we're going to follow Jesus, Revelation says we follow him wherever he goes. And where did he go? To the cross. To the cross. With the example of Jesus before us, how could we ever abuse others, especially at a time when they're hurting financially? Okay? I think that's... Jackie? Oh. As Nehemiah heard of this cruel oppression, his soul was filled with indignation. I was very angry, he says, when I heard their cry and these words. He saw that if he succeeded in breaking up the oppressive custom of exaction, he must take a decided stand for justice. With characteristic energy and determination, he went to work to bring relief to his brethren. Prophets and kings. Margaret, I think you're next. Yeah, Jesus proceeded to lay down a principle that would make oath-taking needless. He, teach, he teaches that the exact truth should be the law of speech. Let your speech be yea, yea, or nay, nay. And whatsoever is more than these is of the evil one. Jim? These words condemn all those meaningless phrases and expletives that border on profanity. Mm. They condemn the deceptive compliments, the evasion of truth, the flattering phrases, the exaggerations, the misrepresentations in trade that are current in society and in the business world. Can I interrupt for just a second? I work with a lot of people who are among the poor classes, and sometimes people come in to see the doctor, and they hardly know how to talk without all kinds of swear words and abuse and I mean not that they're trying to be bad it's the language they know yeah it's just mm, it's terrible I mean and they'll, they'll do this kind of stuff and oh excuse me uh, I know you don't talk like that uh, oh excuse me I pardon my friend uh, <laughs> yeah pardon my French that's another way of putting it yeah Okay, Margaret, go ahead. They teach, uh, they, they teach that no one who tries to appear what he is, what he is not, or whose words do not convey the real sentiment of his heart can be called truthful. Wow. What we need to remember in all this is that selfishness is the essence of Satan's kingdom. He thinks of no one but himself. How often do we follow his example? Any of us do that? Many of the prophets of the Old Testament spoke out against injustice, for example, and I'm going to read a few more verses, Isaiah 58. 
the Lord, the people asked, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Why should we go without food if we pay no attention? If we don't get credit, why should we do yeah. it? The Lord said, <laughs> yeah. And the Lord says to them, the truth is that all this, at the same time you fast, as you fast, you pursue your own interests and oppress your workers. Your fasting makes you violent and you quarrel and fight. Do not think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers. When you fast, you make yourselves suffer. You bow your heads like low like a blade of grass and spread out sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is that what you call fasting? Do you think I will be pleased with that? The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression, the yoke of injustice, and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. If you put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt and to every evil word, if you give food to the hungry and satisfy those who are in need, then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon. And I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. You'll be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never runs dry. Your people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, uh, uh, building again on the old fortified foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuilt the walls, who restored the ruined houses. Wow. Have you ever wanted to speak up on behalf of someone who is suffering injustice, but you're afraid to do so because in doing so you would have to speak against those in positions of wealth or prestige? I'll let you think about that out there. One of the challenges of this lesson is to understanding human anger. Nehemiah was very angry when he found out what was happening. Moses had been very angry when he realized the people were dancing around and worshiping the golden calf. And I, every time I read about that story, I have to think of a terrible cartoon I saw one time in a religious magazine, I might add. And it shows Joshua and Moses standing side by side coming down the mountain. And the, you can see in the distance out there, they're dancing around the golden calf. And Moses has this shocked look on his face and he goes like this and he drops the two tables of stone and they shatter into pieces. And Joshua says, you break all ten at one time and all you can say is, oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the cartoon. Well, but God's anger is mentioned a number of times in Scripture as well. Uh, does God ever lose his temper? Are his emotions ever out of his control? No. Surely every Christian would have to answer no to those questions. So, what are we talking about? For a more detailed analysis of God's wrath as described throughout the Scripture, see our handout. And you can go, and there's the instructions. If you happen to want to get our handout, just go to our website, www.theox.org, and you can go to the Teacher's Guide section, go to the general topics, look for God's wrath or anger as described in the book of Judges. Or if you have our handout, you can follow the URL right there. Can you give, we probably have enough time for a two-minute summary of that. Okay. God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them <clears throat> to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious behavior. Their own choices. Choices, They yes. choose. Yeah. Nehemiah didn't act rashly. He carefully thought through the issues and pondered in his heart what should be done. Could it be true that indifference against evil is one of the worst sins? Do we ever observe evil and we just keep quiet about it? God had spelled out very clearly earlier in their history how he expected the Hebrew people to treat widows and orphans and even the foreigners living among them. And there's lots of verses. Deuteronomy 10, uh, I'll pick a couple. Let me just pick Deuteronomy 10, 18. He makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live with our people and gives them food and clothes. I mean, this is God. In this chapter, Nehemiah clearly practiced the Christian principles as expressed in Mark 10, 30, 43, and 44. And this is principles given by Jesus many, many years later. And it says, 
This, however, is not the way it is among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one who, of you wants to be first, he must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. So are we doing that? Can you think of a time in your life when you had to do something very challenging or distasteful in order to properly take care of your family or loved ones? This is a, this is a problem. I mean, uh, we, what's going to happen in the future when Adventists are made, made practicing Sabbath keeping is illegal? What are we going to do with our family members who may not be members of the Adventist church? Are we going to say, C'est la vie? That's the way it is. Um, are we are we at this point in time trying to prepare for that? I, you know, as I see what's going on in the world around us, I can't believe that we're very far from the second coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We saw in British news last night, oh boy. Bolivia, that it's passed a law that ten-year-olds can work to help support their families. These kids should be going in to Britain? school. Bolivia, oh, Bolivia, South America, yeah. Yeah. and they interviewed these children that are going out sell, doing all kinds of menial things to try to gather a little bit of support for their family, and they should be going to school. Wow. The world's just so desperate. We're so blessed living in this country, and they had quite a segment on that on BBC News last night. Wow. I was surprised oh, they wow. spent so much time. Well, here's a final challenge for you out there. What could you do? What could we do for the poor, the homeless, the indigent living in our communities? Is that a special challenge for Seventh-day Adventists? How well have we done in the past? I can tell you that our church is known in other parts of the world as a church that takes in people at the very lowest financial and and, and troubled areas of life and educates them and builds them up and and sometimes ends up, they end up lo- leaving the church after they got an education and been helped by the church all the way along. Are there injustices being being done at your house in your home? Are there injustices being done in your work or at school? Maybe where you are, among your friends. Do you dare to speak up as Nehemiah did? What an example he would be for all of us. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this example of one particular instance of what Nehemiah did. We, we're going to study many others that he and, and Ezra were involved in. But we, we look at this and we realize that we need to go beyond what's just required by the law. We need to be thinking about others and how everything we do impacts them. And not only that, how we can reach out to them even when they're not asking for help. Give us the vision to do what is right and what is best in your eyes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.